Good morning and welcome to worship at Maple United Methodist Church on this third Sunday of the Pentecost season, June 26th. We're glad to have you worshiping with us this morning and pray that your worship experience with us will be a time of learning, a time of blessing, and a time of growing. I do want to remind you that next Sunday is the first Sunday of July. Yikes, hard to believe that already. But uh, it is the first Sunday of July, so we will have the Sacrament of Holy Communion next week. I invite you to, today to be prepared ahead of time so that you can celebrate the Sacrament with us. Hear this greeting on this Lord's Day. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. We come to you, O Lord, seeking answers to our questions. We come to you, O God, because you are our creator. But I have trusted your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. We come looking for a song to sing. We wait for your voice to call us from beyond our fear. We come. You know, although we believe and trust in God, sometimes we forget the covenant that God has made with our ancestors, and we have sinned. However, God shows us mercy, and he remembers his covenant with us, giving us his peace. He calls on us to remember that peace, to remember that covenant, and to pass it on to others. I invite you this day, this week that lies before us, to show God's peace to your neighbors. As we come towards the end of June already and look forward to the month of July, we are reminded of the upcoming 4th of July holiday. We're reminded that folks will be traveling, families will be gathering, there will be celebrations, parades, speeches, but there'll also be those that are dealing with the memories of war, the aftermath of battles. So as we come to this time when we celebrate our nation's birth, let us also give thanks for those that have fought to defend it, both past and present. Let's remember those two that, for one reason or another, are unable to gather with family this summer. Maybe it's because of COVID. Maybe it's because of some other illness or tragedy in their lives that prevents them from traveling. For some, let's be honest, it'll be the price of gasoline. Let's pray for our country, for the difficulties that we as a nation, as a society, are facing right now. Let us truly pray for one another that we might be healed, that we might be encouraged, that we might be strengthened. Let us pray. Forgive us, Father, for forgetting. For forgetting the tenets of faith on which our nation was built for forgetting the prayers that undergirded this nation as it was born, for the faith of our ancestors, for those who dared to leave behind all that they knew and held dear, to come to a wilderness where there were people who didn't speak their language, people who didn't even look like them, and yet they came, the pilgrims, the pioneers, 
those who were seeking religious freedom, those who were seeking freedom from taxation, those who were just seeking a new start in life. We thank you for their faith. We thank you for their courage in spite of their fear. We thank you for the stamina that they showed as they carved out cities and villages and homesteads as they created a nation that the world looks to as a model of democracy. We pray, O oh Lord, this day for our country, for those that are in positions of leadership, not just nationally but locally as well. We pray for your wisdom to infuse them, for your compassion to fill them. We pray for open ears and open minds and sensitive hearts to the needs of the people. We pray, O oh Lord, for your guidance, for decisions that have to be made that will ultimately impact us all. We pray for our members of Congress, both on a national and a state level. We pray that as they debate the things that are threatening to tear us apart, that they might also be sensitive to what is best for all. Not everybody will be happy, Lord, but we pray that understanding might prevail. We pray for our loved ones, our families and friends, Lord, that are suffering from various ailments and diseases, who are recovering from surgeries. We pray for those that are facing the homegoing of loved ones and friends. We ask for that promised peace that passes understanding for them as they mourn those they have lost and celebrate the lives that have been lived. We pray, O oh Lord, for understanding. There's so much in this life that we face that just, just doesn't make sense. And we need your guidance, we need your help to understand. And O oh Lord, when we can't understand, we need your help to just hold on. To continue to believe in you, to continue to believe in the future, even when it's dimmed by clouds. Grant us your guidance this day. Speak to our hearts, to our minds, to our spirits. Fill us with a new resolve to continue to press on toward what you believe us to be, to what you know we can be with your strength. Fill us with hope that as we deal with one another, as we speak to those that are struggling for answers, that we might be able to speak a word of hope, a word of faith, a word of encouragement. Enable us to hear the pain of those around us and enable us, O oh Lord, to be able to minister to that pain with your love with your strength. Speak to us this day from your word. May we hear afresh a word from our God that will touch us and change us for this day and the days that lie before us. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Scripture this morning is from the Old Testament, from the singer of the Psalms, from King David. Let me remind you of one thing about King David's life that maybe you forgot about. King David had a son. His name was Absalom. He loved his son. And Absalom died. 
David was devastated. Many of the Psalms were written during that period of grief after his son passed away. And I think Psalm 13 may have been one of them. It says it was written for the director of music, but it is a psalm of David. How long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But, I love that word, but, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. This is the word of God for God's people. Thanks be to God. I want to start with telling you a story this morning, a true story. It was the second Sunday after I'd moved to a new church. About an hour before I went across the driveway to the church building for worship, the phone rang at the parsonage. I lifted the rece receiver and heard a question that still haunts me to this day. Are you sitting down? That is not a question you like to hear on the telephone first thing on a Sunday morning. I knew something bad must have happened. It was the treasurer from my previous church, the one I just left three weeks before. I wasn't prepared for the next words out of her mouth. New Hope Church is on fire. It is burning to the ground. Somehow, I managed to fulfill my pastoral duties that day. My new congregation was able to put themselves in a sister church's shoes, and they graciously granted me a few days off to minister to the needs of my previous flock, who at that moment did not have a pastor. In fact, he wouldn't be arriving for another three weeks. The day after the fire, I stood at the site of my former church with my arms around a snowy-haired saint as she wept in anger, frustration, and pain beside the smoldering ruins of her church. Amid the desecrated cemetery behind that smoking hole in the ground, lay the overturned headstones that marked the final resting place of her beloved husband and his parents. Graves that she had faithfully tended every single day of the year for the past six years. When she finally raised her tear-streaked face from my shoulder, I saw a look of mixed bewilderment and defiance. And when she spoke, it was with the forthright honesty that I had come to love in this dear child of God. Reverend Linda, I have a confession to make, she said. When I first heard about the church, I was shocked and hurt. But then I got mad. I got mad and I shook my fist at God. And I said, why? 
Why, God, did you let this happen? Why didn't you stop them? And then she hung her head in guilt and embarrassment. I thought of others who have expressed similar feelings in slightly different situations. I thought about how my family had felt just a month earlier when a dear friend of ours died of liver cancer. She'd never been sick or hospitalized a day in her life. Just ten months previously, she discovered a malignant lump in her breast that led to a mastectomy. Assured they got it all, she went back to teaching soon after. A bout with a seemingly persistent flu bug sent her back to the doctor four months later. Diagnosis, inoperable cancer of the liver. Three weeks later, she was dead. There were those in the school system where she taught, in the church where she worshipped, in her family and even in ours, who mentally, if not physically, shook their fist at God and demanded answers to humanly unanswerable questions. And then I remembered in the second spring in my first church ever. A phone call one early Saturday morning that sent me flying to the hospital. A 15-year-old boy in our church was nursing a bruised shoulder for the past three weeks. Had just been wheeled out of surgery. The doctor's diagnosis, bone cancer. Prognosis, three months to a year to live. His parents, his sister, his three brothers, his entire church shook their fist at God and demanded to know why. Chemotherapy brought a remission. The entire village where he lived held its collective breath. One month, two months, Three months, and then the demonic disease returned, and in less than four weeks, he was gone. The church and community had already lost three 15-year-old boys in the three years previous to Jay's death. And collectively, they raised their clenched fists to the heavens and cried out for the whereabouts of a loving God. I doubt that there is one person within the sound of my voice today who has not experienced similar feelings of frustration and anger at some of the inconsistencies of life and faith. When the security of family and home is ripped apart by misunderstanding, unfaithfulness, separation, or divorce, adults and children alike rail against heaven. A diagnosis of an incurable disease in a loved one or in our cells causes us to flex our fingers and consciously or unconsciously storm the gates of heaven. A senseless death, a tragic accident, an inexplicable action like the deliberate torching of a church and desecrating of a cemetery, or the mass murder of innocent children, sparks feelings of rage and injustice that are not easily pacified by glib comments or pat answers. Decades ago, there was a television commercial that ended with a clap of thunder and the quotable statement, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. Most of us have a similar thought when we feel anger rising in our spirits towards the creator and governor of the universe. 
it's not nice to get mad at God. Down through the centuries of Christianity, we have unconsciously learned or been deliberately taught that a true Christian does not lose their temper, and certainly not at God. We tend to believe that when our world crumbles in, when all our hopes and dreams shatter like fine crystal on a cement floor, that the Christian thing to do is to emulate the prophet Job, who in the face of losing everything that he held near and dear, maintained his composure somehow, and declared, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. In my attempt to find some kind of comfort for the guilt and embarrassment of my white-haired saint, who had lost her church home to arsonists. The Lord confirmed something that I had long suspected to be true. It's okay to get mad at God. It's okay. Fist shaking does not negate your faith. It confirms your humanity. The psalmist, verbally if not physically, shook his fist at the Almighty any number of times. First few verses of this morning's scripture alone bears testimony to that fact. How long, O oh God? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Surely the Israelites, the chosen ones of God, did more than their fair share of fist shaking. Periodically slaves, often defeated in battle, frequently under the tyrannical rule of one dictator or another, they often felt deserted by Yahweh. The followers of Jesus, I'm sure, had their fist-shaking moments too. When their beloved teacher and master was hauled before the Sanhedrin on trumped-up charges, they were furious. When a suspicious, disbelieving high priest engineered his death, the disciples were outraged. When the one they believed to be the Messiah died a criminal's death on the cross, I'm certain at least one of them, if not all of them, shook their fist at the darkening sky and screamed, Where are you, God? Don't you care? Even Jesus himself, in his time of deepest agony and despair, unable to clench his fist because of the nail driven through it, cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's okay to get mad at God. Fist shaking doesn't mean you don't believe, it means you don't understand. It's not an indication of hypocrisy, rather it's an evidence of humanity. Fist shaking is an honest expression of anger, frustration, and helplessness. I believe that in a sense when we shake our fist at God, we're praying for wisdom, for understanding, for guidance, for the power to accept what has happened or is happening. Yes, there are some things that are impossible for us to accept. A stroke or heart attack that leaves a, a once strong body paralyzed or seriously weakened, the discovery of an incurable untreatable disease in a loved one 
for ourselves. The sudden death of a child. The deliberate burning of a church. A physical attack on the elderly or handicapped person. The mass execution of children. We can't begin to understand such things. So how can we accept them? The psalmist, I think, gives us a clue in the final two verses of this morning's scripture reading. David says, but, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has been good to me. That's not the same as Job's seeming statement of resignation. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. No, I think David's comments in the 13th Psalm is more like Paul's statement of faith as recorded in 2 Timothy, the first chapter. I know whom I have believed. And I'm sure that he is able to guard until that day everything that I have entrusted to him. For the psalmist and for Paul, when the tragedy is past, when the weeping has ended, when the fist shaking is over, God is still God. And God is still good. In spite of the present tragedy, regardless of the current trial or tribulation, no matter what the momentary anger that causes you or me to raise a fist clenched in anger, God is still in control. Our past experience has proved that. If we only pause to reflect, as the psalmist did, to reflect upon the fact that God has indeed dealt bountifully with us in the past. More importantly, after all is said and done, God can and will use any and every situation, whether good or bad, to strengthen us, and enable us to strengthen one another. The distress or trial or heartache that causes us to storm the gates of heaven with a clenched fist is not always God's perfect will for his people. But we are an imperfect people living in an imperfect world. And many of the tragedies and much of the anguish that we suffer as a result of that sinful imperfection. If we can remember that, if we can remember, as Paul wrote to the Romans in the 8th chapter, that all that happens to us is working ultimately for our good, as long as we love God and are fitting into his plan. If we can hold on to the truth of 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that no temptation or trial or tragedy or hardship has overtaken us that's not common to all, that God is faithful, and he will not let us be tempted beyond our strength, but even with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. If we can hold on to those truths, then the clenched fist raised in anger will become a hand raised in victory. Let us pray. We don't understand. So many things in this life, O oh Lord, just don't make sense. Our mental processes cannot 
get a grip on the evil of our world. Our hearts are bombarded and broken with the tragedy visited upon our planet. Our eyes fill with tears at the way your people treat one another and the way we treat this gift of nature that you've given us. We don't understand. But with David, we will remember that you have dealt gracefully with us in the past. You have poured out your blessings upon us without number. And this, even this too, shall pass if we seek your will if we follow your way, if we hold on to the gift of faith that you've given us. Speak to us in the times of anger and despair that we might unclench our fists and grab hold of your hand and follow you into tomorrow. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Soon and very soon, O oh Lord, we will understand. Go with us this day into all that lies before us. Go with us this week into all the challenges and temptations and frustrations that we face and remind us that ultimately you are the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and with you all things are possible. Amen.